Yar, folks, welcome back. This is day eight of the International Live Stream Congress. And with us right now, as I'm setting up the laptop here, live from Reykjavik, my homeland. Oh, I so miss <laughs> Reykjavik. We have, let me let me cut away from my ugly mug to this beautiful lady, Birgitta Jonsdotti. Um, it's all yours for the next two hours. Take it away, Birgitta, and uh, we'd like you to start off by talking about uh, Iceland, my homeland, I so miss it, and, and the <laughs> Icelandic Modern Media Initiative. So tell us a bit about yourself, Birgitta. All right, so um, first of all, I'm just going to explain a little bit who I am. I'm very happy to be here. Uh, I've been um, a supporter of the Occupy movement since day one, and all the other uh, Occupy and... Uh, uh, all the other movements that are calling for social change, uh, and um, I think it is uh, so amazing to actually um, witness uh, the fact that there are people, there have never been as many protests happening simultaneously around the world, uh, and they're all about uh, the issues that are so important to me, uh, which are uh, more direct democracy, uh, and uh, more freedom of information and expression and speech, and now increasingly more demands that our online uh, privacy is held sacred as our offline privacy. So um, I'm an Icelander, uh, like D, and um, <laughs> it's been miserable in Iceland, by the way. It's just been raining and raining and raining, and it's apparently the worst summer for as long as anybody can remember. So oh. it's nothing... I miss the rain. <laughs> oh, Iceland, everything I don't. about it. <laughs> I don't. Uh, anyway, so <clears throat> um, in 2008, Iceland had um, the world's third largest financial meltdown, uh, and all because of um, nepotism and the perfect marriage between the corporate and the state. Same old, same old. It's the same stuff all over. Uh, but it became so incredibly big here because um, we live in a really small society. There are only 320,000 of us. So it's quite rare actually to have two Icelanders uh, simultaneously in the same space. <laughs> uh, and um, what happened when you have a crisis like this? It's actually really good. Uh, even if it was quite a bit of a shock for most Icelanders, it was also uh, an incredible relief for lots of people because nobody liked the times before the crisis, or not many, nobody that I knew at least, uh, really liked it because uh, it was all about consumerism and uh, superficial things. So when we had this really juicy crisis, we also had a realization by most people in Iceland that uh, everything that people had put their trust in had failed us be the academia, the media, the politicians, the regulatory system, uh, you name it. So uh, within the time of crisis, you have profound chance of change. And so um, when you have a profound chance of change, uh, like the crisis that happened in the U.S. after 9-11, that brought the United States the infamous Patriot Act, uh, very similar laws were passed in uh, the UK and other European countries. Um, and the reason why such bad laws were made was because uh, us, the, the, the people that define themselves as the 99%, uh, weren't ready. We're, we had not prepared for what are we going to do after the crisis. I was fortunate enough to read a book uh, by a Canadian called uh, Naomi um, Klein, uh, which is called the shock doctrine. So I was aware that during times of crisis you had usually bad laws made, but it was also an opportunity for good laws. So I sort of accidentally stumbled into a situation where I helped create a political movement uh, which got um, a 7.2% of the vote. Uh, we were just created like eight weeks prior to elections and uh, no 
a parliamentarian or professional politician were allowed to run. <clears throat> so it was up to us that sort of started it um, to uh, make ourselves available to run. I wasn't really going to run. I just couldn't find enough women to take uh, leadership <laughs> uh, because they usually take a little bit longer to make uh, big decisions like this. So just after I got into parliament, then now it's worth to note that I am, uh, I, I was the only geek in the parliament. So I come from the background of uh, uh, being a poet and a, um, well, I was the first Icelandic woman to go into web development uh, back in 95. So I'm sort of a native to uh, uh, the movement of people that um, felt like they were having a true impact of shaping the internet in its early sort of visual days. Uh, and I really love the internet so much. It is, it's completely transformed and changed my life. And it has um, made it possible for somebody like me that's from a tiny island with very few people to be able to collaborate with people from all over the world that are like-minded, find them, share knowledge, share um, uh, projects. And um, anyway, so I was invited to speak at a conference in, it was on 1st of December 2009, and this conference uh, was uh, pivotal to me. It completely changed um, my life because at the conference there were a couple of people speaking. Um, uh, from an organization that very few people knew about. The organization was called Wikileaks. Uh, and the guys that were speaking just before me, I was speaking at the conference as well. And I don't really remember about what, uh, uh, but something geeky. Uh, and um, they were speaking, these two guys are called uh, Julian Assange and Daniel Berg, now Dom Scheid Berg. No, Daniel Smith, it was his allies. Uh, anyway, so they're speaking about this incredibly good idea. You know, why don't we, like, instead of having, like, like you know how it is if you want to create a sort of tax haven? What you would do is you would go and look for all the best laws in order to have a really good secrecy about the banking uh, sort of, um, what do you call it, drawer companies and so forth. And, and uh well, what I call uh, onion companies. And um, um, so, yeah, so they were saying, like, why don't we do the reverse of it? Why doesn't Iceland do the reverse of it? Uh, to have a uh, transparency haven. And, um, and why don't Iceland, uh, you know, instead of being best at uh, failed banking um, grandiose, uh, why don't doesn't Iceland apply itself uh, to become the country with the best uh, freedom of information expression and speech laws? And um, and I thought, wow, this is a good idea. Like, like uh, you know, sort of uh, transparency tortola. <laughs> Everybody knew all the names of the Cayman Islands uh, at the time because uh, we have had been unraveling this incredible scam around the banking system in Iceland. And there were some discussions if we would have had more better Freedom of Information Act, better laws for whistleblowers to encourage them to come forward, we might have had a, a little bit less severe um, uh, crisis. Anyway, so um, we had actually invited Julian and Daniel and some other people to uh, speak about you know, WikiLeaks, what it was, and, and this idea uh, at a grassroots center later that day or in the evening. And afterwards, I went uh, out to eat with them, and I, I approached them and said, well, uh, why don't we just do this? Uh, why don't we take this vision and make it into reality? And that's how my collaboration started with uh, people from WikiLeaks and, and many other people. And we started uh, immediately working on this, which was quite exciting. And, and um, not only that, uh, we got a lot more people into the um, this uh, quest. 
because we went on a search and looked all over the world for the best laws that would make Iceland into a safe haven for freedom of information expression and speech. Now, at the time, this was like late 2009, early 2010, um, there wasn't as much awareness and discussion about the privacy issue, so that was not included in this package. And that is my next big mission. <clears throat> um, so we're working on this project, and uh, Wikileaks was quite liked in Iceland uh, and respected because they had uh, allowed the Icelandic people to have access to, uh, through the website, to somebody leaked the loan books from one of the big banks. And it was very uh, important for investigative journalists and then later on the special persecutor and then, of course, the Icelandic nation. Uh, but what really charmed the Icelandic nation so much was uh, Wikileaks' response to the threats of the bank. Uh, if you know, like the bank threat to sue them, and if they wouldn't pull the stuff down, and uh, Wikileaks wrote back a really defiant uh, email. So Icelanders really liked uh, somebody that would stand up to the banksters. Uh, so they were, the general public that knew about WikiLeaks were quite, um, and, and politicians and everybody were sort of um, in awe of them already, right? the big leaks and everything. Um, and so I somehow managed, like we put together, instead of putting forward lots of individual bills, I got an advice, why don't you make from one of the parliamentary staff uh, who was very enthusiastic about this project, um, uh, he suggested, why don't you write a parliamentary proposal where you task the government to actually fulfill this vision. And so uh, eventually we sat down in a room uh, with people from many different countries writing. This was the first crowdsourced uh, uh, comprehensive legal package that had been written in the world, I think. We wrote it on something called Etherpad. Some people might know it as Pirate Pads. Uh, and we were writing together in real time, um, a, a, like not only a vision for Iceland, but if it implemented uh, a policy shift for Iceland and where we're going, <laughs> it was quite extraordinary. Uh, and for me, um, the internet as I love it at its best. Um, then, uh, I managed to get it through the parliament uh, in also a remarkable way. I managed to get people all the right. So I, I managed to get some of the most important people in the parliament to co-sponsor this uh, proposal with me. I don't know. Ah, okay. Um, so I'm apparently cutting out quite a bit, um, which and uh, is responsible for it. Uh, am I okay? Now? Am I cutting? Out? All right. So we managed to get this. Um, I, I, ma I managed to lobby for such a way that got people from uh, all the parties on it to co-sponsor it. We had WikiLeaks work. I had uh, we because I was new in the parliament. I about anything, and if uh, so, I, I sold this vision as uh, you would, you know, get somebody on a project with you, and um, and uh, so eventually we got. I got it through the parliament. Uh, I tried to give everybody ownership in it, and got it through the parliament in such a way that it was. Some voices coming in. Uh, um, maybe it's the live feed. Um, no. I well, I can't be monitoring that. And uh, so if you, so. If you could just, uh, if you see questions, just pop them in here and answer them here because I, um, I if I have lots of other sort of programs running, um, it's going to slow down the connection and it's. So, 
introductory proposal uh, accepted in the Icelandic government. Obviously, uh, government and all the parliamentarians said yes. Uh, and then we tasked the uh, the Minister of Culture and Education to um, uh, make sure that all the other ministries would do their job because that requires. Required some witness coming in. Um, yeah, should we start it? Because there is, uh, there are lots of. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. All right, okay. Uh, uh, sorry about that, uh, people that are watching this live stream. I'm always talking to D, who is uh, on the other end, uh, and he's explaining the technicalities for me. Okay, so four different ministries, 10 different bills uh, in order to uh, make Iceland into a safe haven. So it's taking quite a bit of time, actually, much longer than I hoped. Um, so I was very fearful that we would not manage to get all of this done because we um, had elections in April this year. However, um, the new government has pledged to carry on with uh, this work and the steering group that's writing the laws will carry on for the next two years to uh, finalize all the EMI laws that have not been made into laws yet. So we have now... Um, as a result of this, um, the best source protection in the world based on the Belgium law, because we actually went and looked for all the best laws and sort of just copy pasted them <laughs> uh, and made them fit into Icelandic reality. We have a really good Freedom of Information Act, not as perfect as I would have wanted, uh, but uh, just to move anything through a parliament and amend it is tremendous effort. So I'm not really sort of um, upset because we got a really bad law from the ministry and we had to uh, amend it uh, a lot to make it IMI compatible. What we wrote in the law, which is quite important, it, if anybody that listens is listening and wants to um, um, find a way to influence policy in their own countries, is that we wrote into it a few good hacks. One was uh, to make one minister responsible and that minister always has to uh, report to the parliament about the status and it's every three months. And it's quite embarrassing if you don't have anything to report about. Uh, and secondly, we wrote in that we'd always have the best possible laws. So that means that we need to upgrade the laws. Like in Canada, you used to have a very good Freedom of Information Act, uh, but it's not been upgraded and now it's one of the world's worst. Uh, so laws today, they need to have an upgradability, just like, you know, we're constantly upgrading our uh, uh, softwares and um, our systems in the computers. Um, and we have to do the same thing with laws as well. Actually, after I became a lawmaker, I, I uh, have even less respect for laws because now I know how they're made. It's like you look into the sausage and it's not pretty. Um, and that's why we need the general public to be much more aware of what their representatives are up to. That's one of the biggest disappointments after being a, a parliamentarian is to witness how little people are um, uh, looking into what we're doing. I can do anything and nobody would know. <laughs> it's quite disturbing, <laughs> actually. Um, Anyway, um, so IMI is in good shape. If people want to look into it, like uh, what it's all about, uh, you can find the uh, the breakdown of all the different laws we looked into at uh, the website, immi.is. Uh, but we're basically looking at, you know, how do you make good whistleblowing laws uh, for whistleblowers in such a small community? I mean, that is probably the hardest uh, part to make... Uh, good whistleblowing laws that will encourage people to blow the whistle despite, imagine if you live in a little village and um, somebody 
is blowing the whistle on the boss in the village. Now everybody's going to know who it is. <laughs> Uh, and so how do you encourage the person to do it if there is any wrongdoing? Um, it's very tricky. So I've, that's been one of the hardest uh, laws to, to make. Um, history protection is something very, very in incredibly important. And that is our historical records online. Um, then many people are not aware of the fact that uh, our online history is constantly being changed. Uh, or actually rewritten. Uh, there are actually modern book burnings happening uh, all the time. Uh, for example, and in every library in the world at the same time. For example, uh, quite common, I know of some stories from Canada, for example, where uh, news uh, or interviews, for example, an interview, interview with uh, Singer Bjork uh, about a um, Canadian mining company that bought up... Uh, uh, energy re resources in Iceland. Um, she made an interview. They threatened to sue the newspaper, the Canadian newspaper, and uh, this magma energy company. And uh, in, instead of keeping the story running, they changed it. <laughs> uh, and so this is happening all the time, real time, and even with stories way back in time. Uh, so history protection or historical records protection is very important. It's very important to protect those that pass the information between people. Uh, so let's say I'm publishing a story uh, or anything. Uh, I'm publishing a blog and it might be controversial. And so I'm, I find it to be quite awkward that the person that's just simply mediating the information, the vehicle to share my blog with you, uh, is held responsible for my blog and is threatened to be shut down if it keeps uh, mediating this information, this data between places. That's one thing that needs to be clarified uh, in law. And um, then, of course, we have, have um, uh, limiting prior restraint, <laughs> very important in Iceland, uh, as it is in many countries. Uh, we also have... Um, um, what else is there? There is um, source protection, whistleblowers, limiting powers. Ah, liable tourism. Uh, that's a very interesting thing, actually. It's uh, there is this notorious court in the UK uh, that uh, is very expensive to defend yourself uh, if you are uh, brought into this court by sort of legal tourism uh, so so let's say and this is actually a real story from Canada <laughs> uh, there was this uh, writer that wrote a book about the gold uh, company uh, gold mining company in Canada uh, she wrote a book about them uh, it was yeah and then like uh, it was a Canadian publisher and uh, of course, uh, Canadian mining uh, corporations, uh, their history is not very flattering. Uh, so I don't think it was a pretty book uh, for them, <laughs> if it was the truth. Uh, and so somebody bought like, I don't know, three or ten copies in the UK. And then uh, it was possible to sue the writer in the UK. And even if the writer would win... Um, it's so expensive to defend yourself that everybody that is not super rich is going to uh, uh, lose. Uh, and I just actually got an email from a person that did a documentary about this. Uh, I met uh, him uh, a few years ago. Just told me that the uh, documentary is finally finished. So I'm very excited to see it. Uh, and because this is such an important story, And so, uh, uh, and so, yeah. <laughs> um, anyway, so um, that's something that is very important to have. Actually, uh, uh, actually, maybe I should shut down the sound from UT, or do you? Okay, yeah, great. <clears throat> um, 
yes. So um, libel tourism is one of ways to shut people down. Uh, there are, like in the UK, there are um, something called uh, super injunctions, which is a really freaky thing. Uh, I didn't really believe that existed until I started to doing this work around the Icelandic Modern Media Initiative. Uh, and uh, after I've started to be uh, um, an advocate for freedom of information uh, and speech, I've heard a lot of stories. But super injunction junction is very interesting as thing. It's so weird that it's accepted in any civilized country. So as a like, let's say I'm a journalist and I write a story uh, about a mining company or something, or an oil company, or a politician, or a sports person. Um, a judge can, uh, if a judge is asked by, let's say, the corporation uh, to put uh, silence me, put a super injunction on me. He can, uh, and it's usually done in the night. <laughs> uh, and then I, as a journalist, cannot tell that I am under uh, a gag order. Now, let's say my friend D gets uh, gets to know about that I am gagged. Then he is automatically gagged as well. <laughs> it's just incredible. And we call ourselves democracies. It's just a mockery. Um, anyway, so the... The important message about the Icelandic Modern Media Initiative, which we usually call IMI, is that uh, even um, on a member of parliament, from the smallest, tiniest party, uh, can get something done in the parliament that's never been done, because we are in times of crisis. Um, and that means that you can sometimes get good stuff done. And... Uh, so I somehow managed to do something that had never been done in the Icelandic parliament in all our history, and that is a parliamentary proposal through the parliament. Um, by, because when you do parliamentary proposals or bills, it's usually by the government. It's not the parliamentarians that define the course of your nation. Uh, and I hope that it sets an example for other members of parliaments because uh, our democracies are completely a complete train wreck. Uh, and uh, parliaments have given away their power completely. They're just rubber stamping machines for uh, the very same people that the parliament should actually be telling what to do. Uh, so in a way, I, I am very pleased that I managed to turn the tide a little bit and give the parliament more power. Uh, I don't know if it will hold. But it is an example, and I hope that others can use it. Uh, it is very, very important, even if you are an activist, or uh, even if um, you don't believe in the system, that you go and hack into the system, because you're not going to change it just by having consensus discussions in the streets. It's just nothing is going to change that way. We have to go and hack in, understand how it works, uh, in order to bring forward the changes that uh, from inside to to get the tools the legal tools to, so that we can make the system smaller and so that we can have more responsibility. And the sad part is that most people don't care enough about their democracies to, uh, in order to spend any time actually building it and co-creating co within it. So um, uh, we have to, it is really our responsibility is to both go inside and hack inside the systems uh, and understanding how they work is so important. I've learned so much while I've been in there. And I have to tell you, I am not going to be in there for very long. I'm, I only went back for another term because I, I created another political moment called the Pirate Party and I felt that it was important that I would share my knowledge with the next generation of people going inside uh, in servitude. Um, and I, am, I want to share what I've learned and one of the things that I've learned and which is the most disturbing thing is that there are so many tools that we already have. Uh, but we just don't care enough about our democracies uh, and our societies to use them. So I'm trying to make them more simple <laughs> and I'm trying to be a part of uh, uh, citizens' uh, initiatives um, such as uh, Better Iceland, where the pirates have uh, 
that were running and are in the parliament uh, have pledged to uh, to work with like anybody, any number of people that put forward an idea uh, about any change. For example, we have a 5% threshold uh, in Iceland in election, uh, which means that lots of people will never get anybody to uh, into parliament uh, to represent them if they don't get above the 5% threshold. So um, currently on Better Iceland, that's the most popular idea that people want to see change. Um, because so many people during these elections uh, uh, didn't get anybody to represent them uh, because it was just below the 5% threshold. They had maybe 3% following or 25 And so we are trying to figure out a way and we're actually going to implement this now in October when the parliament officially comes together for the sort of uh, first real session. And um, I'm really excited about this because I'm really hoping that we can not only have like pirates do this, but all the different parties. And then eventually, if we can develop something that I find to be also exceptionally interesting, once we have trained people to be a part of the de democracy, uh, we can actually start to implement the next level. Um, and that is uh, uh, to use a transferable voting system, which uh, means that eventually in the future, once we have also fix the bureaucratic system which is another very interesting uh, power tool actually the bureaucrats they control our countries much more than the representatives it's important that people know this so they need to hack in there as well <laughs> uh, and to understand the mind of the bureaucrat um, anyway so um, liquid uh, or sort of transferable voting systems or liquid uh, voting is very interesting because uh, it means, let's say, that I really trust um, D to have more knowledge than me on certain issues. Uh, because I, as an individual, I can't possibly know everything about all issues in my society. I will sort of specialize myself in issues that I have passion about. And so I will trust him to vote on the issues, let's say, uh, he knows everything about copyright. So I would trust him with copyright issues. And I know that he is on the same wavelength as I am. And then he would transfer his vote onto somebody he trusts. And so like um, a, a long tail of votes follow um, um, or trust follow uh, each person that moves. It's like a, a pyramid scheme with votes. <laughs> Uh, in a really positive way. So eventually it could end up in the parliament. And then, you know, you know how it is like with uh, elections and that's why so many people feel, you know, I can't be bothered. It's the same sort of people. Um, once they're in there, you can't, you know, they don't do what they promise. And so if you could actually control how many votes each person in the parliament gets to have on each issue, that would change the game completely. And if you start to notice, hey, it looks like this person is completely starting to vote uh, totally differently than um, when, you know, just after elections, I don't trust this person anymore, you can move it on to and take all the votes away from that person and give it to another one that you trust better. So that eventually might actually make it possible for us to just randomly select our representatives from the phone book, which I would find personally to be very interesting. Uh, so that's one way of uh, sort of recreating uh, our democracies. There is another very important element about our democracies, which I'm very worried about. I mean, after the, the Edward Snowden uh, revelations, um, it is obvious that uh, what we feel and you know our notion and understanding about what our democracies are is gone there is absolutely no privacy left nothing uh, and we're not going to regain it unless both we change our behaviors i mean i am looking for alternatives for example from spy book uh, and i think i found 
one that I'm actually going to invest time and effort into uh, because it's still in a better state. And it's actually uh, founded by a fellow Occupy person. Uh, and this uh, platform is called Evolve Society. And I encourage you to go there and check it out because we can still help evolve it. Uh, it is not a shutdown platform like Facebook. Uh, and it is created around um, the communities that we're trying to build, um, you know, both locally and globally. Uh, it's not based on games and sharing kittens. Uh, I hope it's not going to be a kitten sharing place. I know they're cute, but come on. <laughs> uh, so, and there are alternative, you know, I, we can leave Google if we want to. We're just completely addicted to it. Uh, we can, um, we can leave um, Gmail soon. There are, you know, and actually use properly encrypted uh emails uh, like Gmail. Um, there are some people developing encrypted uh, alternatives to uh, Gmail. Uh, but I have bad news for you. It, we're always just sort of half a step ahead and sometimes 10 steps behind uh, the governments. Uh, and so we have to be, um, we have to be, we have to invest more time in our own societies and we have to learn to be more sustainable. Uh, and we have to uh, make our society smaller somehow. It's really, it's a big challenge, but I think it's very, um, um, very much worth our time. Um, imagine if you would, I encourage you actually, uh, if you don't think that you have time to do it, uh, time, how much time you spend a week just doing likes on Facebook, if you're using Facebook, for example. <laughs> um, there is always time there, you know, it was a, a really great guy that said that time was um, um, abstract or relevant. I don't remember the English word. Um, so it's just in our head, actually. Anyway, so uh, I hope that there have been some questions. Um, yeah. Um, uh, yeah. When I see we have this thing called the uh, Landstormer, which is, um, uh, okay, so we actually took, um, uh, our former prime minister to a court. It was very controversial. I am currently cutting out. Um, okay, I'm going to quickly call you back. Quickly call you back. Hold on. So start asking questions, folks. All right, I'm I'm going to go to the um, the website. Um, Yes, yes, sir. Yeah. Anyway, so um, what were we talking about? The, is the uh, head of the oh, central yeah, bank yeah. away from the lawsuits okay. and prosecutors? Okay, so it's like they get off the hook relatively quickly in years. So like you can't go after them um, except for a relatively short period of time, which is quite annoying. Uh, but uh, we had like after the crisis, there was a special committee uh, put together on behalf of the parliament to investigate what went uh, wrong. Uh, and... Um, it was a thorough investigation into all the banking scheming and and um, uh, and uh, the bureaucratic uh, problems and so forth. Uh, but it also looked into the responsibility of the ministers, uh, including the uh, former prime minister. Uh, and uh, I was in the committee um, that went through this report. Unfortunately. Three days after the report was published, there was, I don't know, 9,000 pages or something. Um, uh, 
uh, the uh, we had the infamous volcanic eruption, <laughs> and um, so you know the focus on that report was never uh, e enough. But I spent actually uh, around I don't know I think I went to seventy meetings to go through the report. I was in the the committee that dealt with uh, the uh, report, and I was one of the MPs that uh, had this very difficult task of deciding should we put uh, you know, our colleagues on trial or not. <laughs> uh, and uh, I felt that, you know, if you are, you know, if you're the captain on the boat and, you know, you, the boat, uh, you know, uh, has a shipwreck uh, because of my incompetence or, uh, you know, uh, reckless behavior, I should, of course, have some responsibility. Uh, so I didn't feel I had any other choice than suggest that this person would go to court. Uh, it was found that uh, this person had, uh, this uh, former prime minister, had indeed uh, broken the constitution. Uh, he, however, didn't get any sentencing or anything that, like that, but... Uh, uh, for people in power to experience anything like this, uh, like he still feels like there are many people that feel that me and the other people that uh, uh, called him to the court were very nasty. Uh, um, uh, we ourselves should be brought to court for doing it. <laughs> so, uh, but at least we tried, um, uh, and you you can. According to this uh, this special court that uh, the parliament um, can pull together, it had never been done in our history before this, uh, after the crisis. Um, so, um, it is possible to hold them accountable, but it should be done because they feel that they are above the law. And, and in my opinion, nobody should be above any laws. All the laws should for like if there is a law that uh, is only for the 99 percent then it's not law it's uh it should be for 100 percent of the people yeah. well so with the icelandic revolution and uh which happened uh, right away with with the collapse in October 5th, 2008, and uh, until change happened in February 1st, and then you were elected to parliament in May 2009. With the last election, um, and now you got the banksters and the conservatives back in, uh, what does that happen to the Icelandic revolution? I know you're an MP and the leader yeah. of the Pirate Party, so. We don't have leaders. I'm, I'm just uh, a humble servant. Uh, we are. Uh, um, a horizontal party so uh um so yeah anyway um what happened was um that people love to be lied to uh and the sweeter the lie the more you know it's like i don't know if you know about the story of this uh wolf that tricks the three little piglets <laughs> it's sort of like that <laughs> Uh, it's very sad and it's very depressing and uh, I just, but it's classic. I mean, it's classic, isn't it? You have one type of governing do, doing a lot of mess and then you have uh, the sort of, it's usually the left-wing parties that come and clean up the vomit uh, after the party uh, and they are like the strict mama, you know, uh, saying, oh, you can't spend so much, we're going to have to reform and blah, blah, blah. And it's very unpopular. They don't give you any promises. They're too sort of honest. And usually what ha and then usually after they do the cleaning up, um, and of course they will do lots of mistakes. It's just always like that in politics. Uh, then usually you get a really big swing of really hardcore, much worse, uh, elements uh, in power. It's just, uh, I don't know. And, you know, sometimes you just want to change voters uh, when you witness that sort of behavior. But 
it's very easy to appeal to the insecurities and uh, you know this promise of that you're gonna get the breadcrumbs you know lots of people vote in the hope that they're gonna have a swimming pool and a big humpy uh, you know or humvee or whatever uh, and uh, that they're only gonna have to work one hour a day and then spend the rest of the day playing golf or something uh, and so I don't know why it is so easy to uh, get people to have absolutely irresponsible and reckless behavior when they go into the voting booth. I mean, how can they possibly believe these lies? I mean, it's nothing that justifies it. I mean, um, so now they're all very disappointed but because they didn't get like one million Icelandic kronas uh, as a check from the government because the government was sort of promising that if they would be elected. Um, I don't know. It's. I, I don't think that we had any proper revolution either. I mean, we had um, and people were angry. They were willing to take chances. I think the the biggest and the most interesting thing that came after the revolution or after the crisis was actually the election of the best party and the fact that we have. Uh, uh, performance artist uh, as the mayor of the city of Reykjavik and actually with him I mean he's one of my all-time favorite um, I don't see him as a politician I'm not a politician myself you know I'm a politician uh, I don't know what to call him uh, but um, there's never been as much peace in the city since uh, he became the mayor it's amazing I mean and his election promise was I promise to break all my promises. I promise to uh, uh, I, I promise to hire all my best friends. Uh, I'm really just looking for a really cozy indoor job. That's the stuff they said. And then they did like simply the best by Tina Turner and uh, in Icelandic verse. And it was just like hilarious. And so he didn't like. And and can you imagine people actually elected somebody telling them that they wanted to be absolutely corrupt. There's still 40%, but, you know, he's, he's, uh, he's done a great job. I mean, he's like, um, um, he's been doing much better um, sort of uh, collaborations within the city than any of his pre predecessors. Uh, and he made everybody watch The Wired. He, he refused to work with anybody unless they would watch, like, a whole TV series. <laughs> <laughs> I think I would have everybody watch Friends or something if I would be in a position like this. <laughs> or Doctor Who, first series. Icelandic water. It's the best. Now, this is, you're at the International Livestream Congress and you are the keynote panelist. And, um, Turns I'm a lot, lot. with myself. Yay! Yay! That we like it that way, right? <laughs> uh, one or two. Um, now, in, in terms of, say, we live streamers, right now, um, we're getting harassed. We're getting attacked, physically attacked. By the way, I heard a great stat. Last year, in 2012, mainstream media lost 35% market share to us civilian journalists who sword and shield is live stream because you got a rally in March where you're going to social stream everybody to the live streams because seeing is believing. Now, mm -hmm. we're already seeing examples of our signal being jammed, um, all kinds that our immediate fight in the next year or two is our right for the signal. So we're trying to come up with alternative ways, alternative internet platforms. You know, people have been talking during this Congress about deep web and dark net and peer to peer technologies. Can you talk a little bit about that? Um, I am not an expert in that field. I, um, I think what I've heard about it, it's very important that we do develop, um, uh, you know, good channels where we can communicate without having to rely on um, large corporations. Uh, and I think it is something that uh, some uh, countries are looking into. Um, I fear, though, that uh, if we start to fragment the internet, that that might be uh, the beginning of the end. <laughs> uh, so we have to be 
careful with our solutions so that the solutions won't become the problems. Um, I think if we can um, uh, get sort of large awareness about this importance, I mean, that is the first step, uh, that, you know, that we are at risk of being cut out, uh, that there are already little kill switches everywhere. Uh, and what is actually going to happen to our societies once we start to fragment uh, the internet? Uh, and um, and actually, there has been very little discussion about the power of the uh, telecom companies, which I'm quite worried about. Um, they actually are, they are actually uh, the biggest power mongers online because they. Can you imagine actually the price tag that is on just um, uh, sharing? Let's say we want to do this conversation through a phone line. <laughs> Why the hell is it so expensive? <laughs> I mean, it's crazy. Uh, it's it's not real cost, uh, and there's been very little discussion about all of this. And they also also have all our logs. Uh, and that is also worrying. I know there are lots and lots of uh, different projects all over the place. And I think the biggest uh, problem we are actually facing right now is all this um, uh, classic uh, rivalry. Oh, wow, there's a really big spider on my floor. Uh, uh, it's rare to see spiders in Iceland. Um, uh, yeah, uh, anyway, so um, like the biggest problem we're currently facing internally with all these solutions that we're coming up with is that everybody is uh, inventing the wheel and everybody has the best solution instead of us trying to work um, uh, like in creating a strong network. We don't have it. Why the hell has uh, nobody made pretty good privacy or, you know, PGP more user-friendly. Come on. It's like, it's the worst. I tried to use it uh, and, you know, I'm, I'm trying to train people to use it. But then, again, I don't trust any encryption. I don't think anything we do anymore is safe online. Nothing. All of our methods that we used to use, I don't trust, fortunately. Um, and... That sort of reality that we're having to face. I mean, are we going to be quick enough to be able to create these alternative networks, you know, and, and is it good? I don't know, to be honest. I don't know. Zoe uh, asks from Florida, what can we do about all the U.S. Uh, violation of human rights? I mean, there, of course, typical... Living here in Canada, we know the U.S. better than anyone, but, you know, they're blaming everyone else. But what can we do about all the human rights violations that the U.S. is doing? Well, I think uh, this is a really good question, and it's a question that I ask myself all the time. I, I am, for example, um, a part of something called the International Parliamentary Union, which has been around since 1880-something. They were actually really great about my... Twitter subpoena, uh, you know, when the Department of Justice uh, demanded to have uh, all my personal data from Twitter handed over uh, because of, you know, I had volunteered for WikiLeaks. Um, and they made a really strong uh, resolution on it. Uh, and I was like wondering why the, in the world isn't the United States a part of this union where every other nation in the world is part of it? And it's very difficult to get the United States to be accountable to anything because they refuse to participate in international uh, organizations uh, or uh, follow international law uh, if they don't have veto power. And so it is really up to the people around the world to call upon their representatives to... Uh, to pressure the United States to stop being like China. They are a rogue nation like China. Uh, and it's the only country I can compare the United States to is actually China when it comes to the violations of human rights on their own citizens. It is appalling to see how the United States treats their own citizens. Um, 
you look at the prison industry and you look at you know the third world status in some of the spots in the United States like there is a a genuine third world status uh, on reservations in Hampton in uh, uh, states that are former coal mining states like in West Virginia uh, it's it's worse off than it's in some of the worst areas in Africa <laughs> Do the people in the United States, are they aware of this? Uh, and what are they going to do about it? I mean, of course, the people in the United States are responsible for their own government. It is not actually up to the rest of the world to fix it. It is up to the people in the United States to rise up against it. And you don't need the 99% to rise up. You only need around 4% of people to rise up say, that's it. And it started off really well with Occupy. Um, but uh, the problem that you're faced with such uh, large nations uh, is that you have people going in so many different directions. Um, but I think, I mean, I'm willing to help in any which way, and I have tried, uh, uh, and I will carry on encouraging um, uh, other nations to put pressure on the United States. Um, and it's actually sort of happening right now. Uh, you know, I, th I think the consequences of the NSA revelations uh, is going to be much greater than any, anybody can anticipate right now. Uh, there are discussions about creating sort of, you know, I don't want to call it walls, but sort of walls around Europe, walls around Brazil, uh, and try to force these uh, corporations that host all our data to... Uh, uh, be forced to follow the, the privacy laws in each country or continent uh, to protect our citizens against the United States. I mean, isn't it bloody ironic that the country that goes around the world to force their version of democracy down the throat of so many different nations is actually the nation responsible of destroying the foundation of democracy in the rest of the world? I mean, like, when you take away privacy, it is much more serious than most people realize. When you take away um, the possibility, even if Iceland has the best source protection laws in the world, it doesn't matter. We're not going to be able to protect the sources because they're spied on by the NSA. <laughs> and then, you know, uh, of course, let's not forget the UK uh, and other countries that are using exactly the same methods. Um, and, and sharing it with the United States. So um, a lawyer can't protect the you know, uh, his client's confidentiality anymore. Doctors can't uh, protect uh, the privacy of the uh, medical records or their patients anymore. Um, it's finished the way we know it, <laughs> unless we change it. So it's intense. It's great. It's a very massive, massive crisis, and let's use it and be ready. And let's write the anti, or let's write the Patriot Patriot Act, or whatever we want to call it. Uh, but we have to come with solutions that are doable ourselves, and we have to understand that these changes that we want, uh, they happen with baby steps towards a bigger vision. And so we need to start to work together on where are we going to be in 10, 20, 50, 100 years. Because if we don't start to work on this vision together where we want to be, we're not going to go anywhere. Uh, you got the live chat at Occupy Toronto on. Why don't you read out some questions and answer them? All right. Somebody... All right, so somebody is saying that, you know, people are really, really afraid for a good reason. Um, as soon as we give in to fear, and we might have good reasons to be fearful. Sure, I mean, there's a lot of oppression in our world. But as soon as we give in to fear, they have won. Uh, I mean, I refuse to give in to fear. Absolutely. I mean, I have to remind myself every day... Um, you know, about what's the worst thing that can possibly happen and, you know, where am I right now? And I usually, I've trained myself to be 
quite um, I mean there were lots of there are much more people fear my own well-being than I am myself <laughs> I'm just you know I, I don't know uh, where I would be if I would give in to fear it's very easy though Okay, let me see. So somebody is asking me. Is your experience, do you truly believe working with or within the current political system will ever bring about the level of change that is needed? Um, okay, so let me rephrase this. I'm I'm working within the current. Uh, I'm not working normally. With the current uh, political system. Um, so I'm trying to apply new methods. Uh, hoping that uh, by understanding how the current system works uh, and trying to open it so that the general public knows how we operate within the system um, and by crafting and making the legal tools so that people can engage more that we can change the system. It's not going to be easy and it actually requires a lot of work by uh, the people out there, uh, not only the MPs. Uh, and it's very easy to get lost there. You know, it's so many interesting and important issues that keep you occupied. So you have to actually sacrifice a lot of the things that you feel are important and you really have to not care if you're going to get this job again. Uh, that's my greatest freedom. I don't care if I'm not going to get elected. I'm not going to run anyway. But it's never been a motivation to, uh, to, to, to stay there uh, because uh, you can't make friends there. <laughs> uh, you have to be able to be criti critical all the time. Uh, but you also have to be able at the same time to inspire the others who want to do... Um, to jump on your boat if you have something that you feel is get through. Like, you know, one of my greatest passions right now is uh, to be able to uh, Can I just finish? So one of my greatest passions right now is to make sure that we have constitutionally bound that a certain amount of the people, like 10%, can call for national referendum, and 1% can actually put forward a bill. Uh, if I can do that, I can just leave happily ever after and live as well. <laughs> so so there was something you want to ask, D? Did you have a For the remainder of this, just keep reading questions off the live chat and the whatever suits your fancy and answer it. Okay. Um, All right. I'm just looking for some here. Yes. All right, so here is some Americans are talking about leaving the U.S., going to other countries, not safer anymore. Uh, FBI, child molester, rapist, to spy on activists. Well, you know, uh, the problem is that uh, you are always going to find agent provocers everywhere. I mean, I had my own experience with that uh, when I was a part of a relatively radical um uh, environmental organization in Iceland called Saving Iceland. Uh, British police had planted um, an undercover cop within our organization as we're just creating it uh, to try to make us more radical. Like, hey, why don't we get and join the uh, Black Brigade from Athens? You know, the most radical anarchists around. <laughs> uh, and um, so that, you know, if we would have you know, gotten some people from there to join our protest camp, then the police could have justified, you know, uh, being even harder on us. Um, 
think there is any utopia, actually. I don't think there is any one country that's better or worse. I've lived in a lot of different countries, but I do have to say that when I lived in the United States a long time ago, I actually... I left because I didn't want to raise my kids in fear because I really feel that that culture is based very much on fear. Like you have to be afraid of everything. You know, you have to be afraid if there is ice outside your house because somebody might slip and sue you. Um, so there are, um, like Iceland is not a great country to migrate to. Um, um, but, you know, if you have anything that you're a specialist in, it's usually easier to migrate through that. Uh, we're not very good at uh, accepting political asylum seekers, unfortunately. Uh, I really wish we were. I wish I could say to everybody that says, hey, I want to move to Iceland. Uh, I wish I could just say, yeah, come on. <laughs> uh, you know, the system is not going to be a pain in the arse. Uh, but um, it's not like that. It's it's very complicated, like it is moving to any country in the world. Uh, we've created such incredible barriers between us. It's uh, depressing uh, to think about it. Um, there are, however, like lots of people are moving to Norway. They need a lot of people to work there, and they are actually quite a good country. And so is Sweden. Um, <clears throat> so. Um, and there are lots of great countries in Latin America. I really wish I could move to, you know, Colombia or Ecuador or something <laughs> um, myself. Um, but then again, um, you know, if people feel disempowered, there's also Canada just just around the corner. Uh, I don't know what the, my friends in Canada uh, think about that. Um, is it better to live in Canada than in the United States? <laughs> Uh, I don't know. Uh, I haven't lived in Canada myself. Um, let me see. Yes, yeah, so I'm just... Re I, I should actually tell you a little bit about the Pirate Party. Um, uh, let me see. Okay, here's something about Aaron Swartz. So I asked if they can tell us any more about what Aaron Swartz was working on prior to his death, which was allegedly the way public interacts. Now, where is number two to this? You guys are so busy uh, with writing, so I keep losing where I am um I'm not sure like I don't know exactly what Aaron Swartz was doing I, I think he was like doing so many different things uh but I know a guy that is working for a company called ThoughtWorks that are actually carrying on with the work um that Aaron was doing uh and um I'm really hoping that um whatever he started and so many others but in particular him uh um i i do think i hope that his work will carry on i know that there are people putting forward and lobbying for you know bills to be changed uh there are like lots and lots of people carrying on with aaron Swartz's legacy uh but i don't know exactly what you're referring to in relation to him and what he was working on um here is a question. Birgitta, your Prime Minister Sigmund Durgudmundsson uh, is trying to blame the 2008 crash on the EU. Do you think he is trying to take the blame away from the banksters? Um, yeah, obviously. I mean, um, he is. He, his party is in particular acting really funny around the EU. Um, some people from his party think that the EU is Satan. Uh, there are some other people that think uh, the EU is the savior, <laughs> uh, which is neither. It's just uh, sort of um, a two-folded uh, element. One is a corporate sort of alliance to trade, massive bureaucracy, and the other one is, uh, uh, the other element is a uh, free flow of people between European countries, uh, which is actually not very good. I mean, it's great, then it's also horrible. It means that you have the same elements as you have in the States, which is that if you're working for a company, 
you're always being relocated unless you never get any roots, unless you can never be a part of your society. So you, it's easier to control people if they're always moving around. Um, anyway, so, uh, but uh, uh, Sigmundur David Gunnarsson, the Prime Minister of Iceland, and uh, Bjarni Benediktsson, who is the uh, second most uh, powerful man in the Icelandic government, he's the finance minister, they both come from very rich families, uh, so they have no idea what the rest of the people are going through. But uh, Sigmundur has been promising more than he can possibly, um, you know, hand over. Like he's going to break his promises, um, and uh, I think it's going to cost us uh, greatly. Um, I have not heard of the lawsuit against the Bank of Canada. Um, what surprised you about the Constitutional Convention in Iceland? Oh, um, the Constitutional, like the whole Constitutional process in Iceland. That this was one of the great things that happened after the financial collapse. Uh, like there was one of these huge demands by the people that they wanted a new constitution written from really scratch uh, by and for the people of Iceland. And uh, uh, so this process started, like the government, uh, the, the left-wing government um, uh, decided to honor this. And actually, a matter of fact, it had been a dream of the, the former prime minister, Johan, uh, to uh, do this. And so to facilitate the new constitution. And um, so we had this process of where we uh, actually had a, a massive gathering of people randomly selected from the uh, National Registry to, I think there were like a thousand people that were asked to come together and have a sort of a world cafe about what needs to be in our social agreement, what uh, what do we feel is important to have in our constitution uh, and what sort of society do we want to be, what are our values and ethics and so forth. And, um, and then we had, um, uh, after that big meeting, uh, all the, the uh, findings of what the people wanted was pulled together uh, as the basis of the Constitutional Council that was to be elected to process these uh, these basic ideas about what sort of society we wanted to be. Uh, and so we had so many people that wanted to be a part of the Constitutional Parliament that it actually became a problem. <laughs> Nobody was prepared for so many uh, people to volunteer to be a part of it. And um, and then they actually, when they were processing their work, so they took all this feedback from the uh, this assembly, and they also used work that the specialists in the parliament had been working on for a long time about sort of the overall um, foundation, what needs to be in a constitution. And they also looked at constitution from other countries. Uh, and um, and then they started to put forward this idea. Here's the chapter on human rights. Here's the uh, you know chapter on resources and and all this uh, you know the president and uh, you know how the parliament should work and all these different elements. And they didn't keep it to themselves. All their meetings were open, and they put this online so people could actually uh, just use their face to put in suggestions of changes, they could send them emails, they could meet with them, and it was uh, really a beautiful process. I was so proud of it. And then we had a new constitution, a beautiful constitution. I mean, of course, they were going to be, they didn't have a lot of time to work on it, so there were, of course, some technical errors in it, but the genuine spirit in it was just so incredible. I was so proud of my people and we had a national referendum on it and everybody accepted it and then oh, the parliament put it into coma uh, in the last days and we're not going to get this constitution through and this is why like in my last speech in the last parliament before it was dissolved I actually wept, and lots of people 
uh, wept with me. Uh, it was a spontaneous speech uh, because I saw that this was the end of this incredibly beautiful process because people don't have guts and it doesn't matter how great government you have, um, they, if they enter into the system, um, they are like really the cute little apples you put in the barrel that has the rotten apples in it. They're all going to get damaged. We have to re create our systems. Uh, the hardware is completely, it's trash. It's so old, it's falling apart. And we keep trying to put in new system that is uh, never, you, you can't put like a new Mac system into an SE. It's just not going to start. So, I mean, that's uh, the depressing part of it. So annoying. Um, uh, it's very, I don't know. All right. Okay, so here's somebody that asks, how do the courts fit in with new laws? How well do the courts work with to follow these laws? Okay, so um, I'm not sure uh, what laws you're talking about. If you're talking about the Icelandic Modern Media Initiative, we are still waiting for a um, more court examples. Um, they are actually quite important. Uh, um, so, uh, it remains to be seen, uh, how, how the courts will deal with them. Um, okay. So people are talking about food here. Uh, <laughs> we actually need all countries to rewrite their constitutions. And we, I actually, we are, there have been some discussions on how we can just claim our constitution and have like uh, start to use it and um, uh, but we need more people to, to actually get engaged uh, okay Vickeris has posted that it claims is a mature version of the screenplay by Bill Connolly with an African film I haven't seen the film uh, The Fifth Estate um, <clears throat> I did see the first script I was an advisor on the script uh, and so when I saw the first script, I was furious, <laughs> uh, and I was um, giving an opportunity to uh, amend it. I put a tremendous effort into making uh, the um, the script and the film more balanced, uh, so it would not be as sort of biased towards Julian as it first was, and and uh, the spirit of the film changed tremendously from the first script. Um, I was not invited to the uh, film festival in Toronto where it premiered, which uh, I think is a little bit lousy, <laughs> uh, because I, you know, I find it to be strange that all these people are talking about the film and I haven't seen it. Uh, but there was like I could sense, like I met the actors <clears throat> um, and I met the director and I talked a lot to the scriptwriter. I I went through the script. Uh, not only me, but I, I got other people that were involved in this time period here in Iceland to uh, to discuss it with me. What needed to be amended so that it would be wouldn't be so biased. It felt biased, uh, and I know that the <clears throat> Benedict Cumberbatch. You know, I have talked with him numbers of times about this, uh, and the scriptwriter and uh, the director. Uh, they are all supporters of Wikileaks. Uh, I think if this film would have uh, any sort of documentary elements about it, uh, I would be more concerned. It is, after all, a Hollywood film. Uh, and, like, I, you know, the stuff written, like, my parts in it, none of it is absolutely accurate <laughs> whatsoever. Uh, and I really don't care about that, and I didn't try to change my person in it, I was more focused actually on, on, on making sure that it wouldn't be absolutely trashing uh, Julian. Um, because the film was originally based on two divorce books. I mean, Daniel wrote his book just after he broke up with Vicky. It's just like, you know, I don't know if you've written 
or read something yourself after you divorce somebody it's usually you read it like a few months later and like oh my god I'm so glad that I didn't post this anywhere <laughs> and I, I felt that a little bit about Daniel's book um I would not have myself written a book and have it published shortly after it uh, and so the, the and the the Guardian book is also you have a sense of the same sort of you are separating from somebody you worked very closely with and um so I think we managed to balance it actually quite a bit. Uh, it was a lot of work <laughs> to do it. Um, so from what I heard, uh, but I haven't seen it, so I can't. So from what I heard, uh, it's not as bad as it could have been. And we managed to take this this very controversial Iran scene out of it, which uh, was that not have been taken out. I would have uh, pulled completely from the project. Apparently, Barquita, there's someone logged in in the user uh, name Julian Assange. Whether it's your your dear friend Julian, I don't know. This is the World Wide Web, and uh, one never knows. I don't think uh, he did say hi. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> so um, we need. Yeah. Hello, Caribbean. The Dominican Republic. Uh, and Mark Taylor Canfield is a journalist with Huffington Post and others. He's got a question for you right there at the bottom. Constitution, uh, the politicians killed it. They, like all the parties were responsible for the, the death of it. Okay, so there is a question. Where is it? Okay. Uh, sorry, folks. Yes, uh, Mark Taylor Canfield writes, yes, Brigitte, the Hollywood version of the WTO protest battle in Seattle with Andre 3000, Charlie Thurzon, Woody Harrelson, does not uh, portray the demonstrations with complete accuracy. But oh well, <laughs> I guess more well, comment. The only reason I actually um, participated in it, uh, you know, in, in advising on the script, was that I wanted to try to make sure that the message would come through. And I'm really hoping that the message of the importance of whistleblowing, the message of the importance of freedom of information, uh, comes through the film. You know, I don't know if it does or not, but that, you know, my intention to try to, you know, lend that focus on it. And that was my sort of prime um, uh, focus when I was looking at the script, apart from trying to, uh, uh, you know, I just, I couldn't bear the idea of like originally uh, it was sort of like Julian was a bit vilified and Daniel was uh, put up to a pedestal and it just didn't feel right to me because um you know even if julian assange is a very controversial person uh he and you know he's made lots of choices and decisions that you know i don't necessarily agree with and i have done so myself uh, i'm absolutely not the perfect person and i've done lots of mistakes in my life and made many uh stupid decisions um, <clears throat> I tried to learn from them, uh, but um, he has done tremendous uh, with uh, the things that he is responsible for. And the world will never be the same because of what uh, he did, uh, what uh, Manning did, and what Snowden did, and many, many, many others. Uh, and so... Um, you know, I, I will defend that position. You know, there are things that I don't agree with, but I absolutely think it is essential that uh, we honor people for the stuff they've done and we hold them responsible for the stuff they've done too. Um, and uh, while I'm at it, I encourage anybody that's here witnessing this uh, to make themselves familiar with the case of Jeremy Hammond, uh, the case of Barrett Brown, and the many, many other cases that are floating around where there are people in prison for doing 
you know, and, and facing lifetime in prison for um, doing something that uh, should be legal <laughs> or is legal, in my opinion. You know, it's legal, like in Barrett Brown case to uh, to post a link to, you know, with more material that you're referring to in your article. I mean, how how is it possible that this guy is facing 100 years in prison? It's crazy. So um, we we need to just uh, remember to um, stop trolling each other so much. I just keep saying that because I think it is very important that we focus on what we can fight for together instead of always focusing on what fights uh, <clears throat> us. Yeah, the, the Julian Assange film, which was the opening film at TIFF, is called The Fifth Estate. I almost expected you to be there and, and be interviewing you live uh, right beside me, but uh, such as that. Now, there's a film that was, what happened to The Little Mouse That Roared? It's the still little, in um, You want to tell people about that and who the filmmaker is and what she's done before? I think it was the summer 2010 or 11, I don't remember. They were like, he stopped filming coming to Iceland to do it. And he, I'm cutting in and out. Okay. Uh, so there were like all these documentary filmmakers coming and wanted to do a documentary about Julian Assange. And I said, look, I can't facilitate it. I think it was 2010. Uh, uh, and um, uh, but you know I would agree to to uh, be interviewed, and at some states I was getting really bored with this, uh, and so I met this incredible woman called Judith Elridge. Uh, she was here at the Reykjavik Film Festival, and showing a docu uh, documentary that had nominated for the Oscars, really well deserved actually, a documentary about Ellsberg the most dangerous man in America. Incredibly good film. And one inspiration Danny Ellsberg is, uh, I feel so incredibly, incredibly privileged to have I had an opportunity to meet him and uh, participate in a panel with him. Uh, and so she wanted to do a, a documentary about Julian. And there was another guy who was also a really great filmmaker, documentary filmmaker, uh, and I basically told them, why don't you just do a film together? So I just have to do one interview. <laughs> and, uh, and so they started to think about it. And then eventually Judith came back to me and said, I want to do a documentary about the Icelandic Modern Media Initiative. Uh, are you willing to be sort of the subject? And, you know, I thought about it and I thought, yeah, yeah, why not? It's an important thing that I think, like, it's an important standard uh, and important thing that I want the world to be aware of, if that's possible. And so she started to do a documentary and, uh, about me and, uh, and the Icelandic Modern Media Initiative, and it sort of metamorphed into um, uh, a documentary called, originally it was called The Little the Mouse of the Sword, and then it's now open, um, and it focuses on Aaron Swartz and John Perry Barlow and me, I guess a woman can't carry a film about geeky stuff uh, and, and I think uh, the documentary will be ready next year I don't know uh, I eventually I don't know if any of you have been a subject of a documentary filmmaker crew uh, it's you know after two years you just can't take it anymore and I, I reached that state I just can't take it anymore and I hope that's you Hold on, folks. I'm going to just call her right back. Hold on. Hold on. Sorry. Hello. Greetings. Um, all right. So, um, Judith Elrich uh, has lots of stuff um, that uh, I'm sure that she can use. Um, 
And uh, I think it's going to be a really good uh, documentary, uh, or I hope so. And I hope it's going to be ready next year um, because uh, it's. I, I've, I wish it could have come sooner because I think it is. Uh, we're at such critical time, you know. Uh, but um, when it comes to creative people, and I know it myself, you can't push it uh, when it's not ready. <laughs> So it should be ready next year, if we're lucky. Okay, so... Somebody... Anything else? Have I joined... I've organized so many protests. I was like... Because I was, <clears throat> I've been an activist for a long time. Uh, and so I was, and I protest against all sorts of countries. And so uh, I was really uphold around the Olympics, uh, what was happening in Tibet. So I organized protests outside the uh, Chinese embassy for nine months straight every Saturday and did lots of events and movie nights and musical event or you know a big event fundraising event uh, and and when we had the Icelandic collapse because I was the only sort of known protester I got all the phone calls like where do we get megaphones uh, where do we get permissions uh, so I eventually ended up uh, that's how I sort of got involved uh, in all the protests in the beginning so um, I miss it a little bit. We had some really very interesting protests in Iceland uh, during the the what I called the fleece uh, revolution. <laughs> it was this sense of tribal elements that I, I really liked. So, yeah. oh, yeah. Uh, so. How did I get involved in Power Party? Okay, so I helped create uh, a political movement uh, in 2009. That was sort of, uh, you know, the movement that brought me first into Parliament. Uh, it was um, a coalition of all the different grassroots movements um, and uh, sort of a hit and run, a horizontal, horizontal based uh, movement. Uh, it was. Uh, 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 very important to have it horizontal. Originally, it wasn't. So, um, anyway, so um, uh, as I evolved with the Icelandic Modern Media Initiative and all these issues in relation to uh, freedom of information, I realized that like uh, copyright issues are really interwoven with freedom of information issues, uh, and um, and I started to get uh, to notice a lot of the pirate parties were actually taking my um, uh, agenda that I was working with in the Icelandic parliament and adopting it, uh, you know, as their policy. So, like, when I was confronted with one, did I want to join another party because we're dissolving my first party uh, because it was in our rules, it was a hit and run. Uh, did I want to join that or did I want to... You know what did I want to do, and and I, I said to some of my friends, why don't we just sort of create a pirate party? And you know, a few months later, you know, somebody else said, why don't we just do this now? And then we just started to um, lay the foundation for it. And I feel that the pirate parties are, you know, they're not doing really well actually uh, in our world. And and the WikiLeaks party did really badly compared to what. Uh, people thought. And um, I think that uh, the pirate parties, it's very important to get their act together globally. <laughs> uh, because, you know, in Iceland, we were the first pirates to get people into uh, a national assembly. And I was hoping to see many more. There are lots of elections all over uh, Europe and over the world that have relatively established uh, pirate parties that have existed much longer than, uh, than ours. Uh, and they didn't manage, they don't seem to be managing to get people in. And the reason why I say the pirates are very important is that they are the sort of the political arm of the information revolution. And uh, within it are the only people that truly understand uh, 
you know, the flaws in a lot of the laws that are, you know, currently uh, attempts to pass, um, there are so many horrifying ideas floating around uh, within the polit established political parties uh, and they, they don't understand how bad these ideas are uh, because they don't understand... Um, you know they don't they just don't understand the technology and they don't understand the internet uh, and you know they they have this idea we should make the internet safe you know <laughs> come on okay before you, you even try that idea why don't you make it safe to drive you know why don't you make a car safe you know the internet is a vehicle and so uh it's it's just crazy ideas and 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 the attempts to do this is like yes let's make sure there is no pornography on the internet or let's make a shield around iceland so icelanders will never have to see pornography or let's uh, and you know that would actually slow down the internet if you would have massive uh, state filters like that and it would be the beginning of uh, other filtering, which we've seen in other countries. And if Saudi Arabia can't have their pornography filter work, why in the world would we do stuff like this? It's just crazy. Uh, or the idea of, uh, hmm, uh, let's uh, criminalize a whole generation uh, uh, through the big corporate uh, copyright holders. Uh, yes, uh, sharing books is forbidden. Uh, you have to record uh, which books you lend and how many people you lend them to, or we will put you in prison. <laughs> it's just crazy stuff. So um, we need people that understand that this is crazy talk, so it won't become laws, for example. Um, so, um, <clears throat> and um, um, if we don't have people in like we did, there was this awful law that was just passed in Iceland uh, a few days ago. And that's why I've been really busy and I didn't have time to uh, join you earlier. Uh, it's a law that allows uh, an institution in Iceland to collect all information about death uh, from ordinary citizens. So uh, if I owe something, the government will now know, uh, you know, if uh, whom I owe it to and for what reasons. Now that's crazy. So um, anyway, um, I think um, uh, there is no political power right now as uh, important in the world as the, well, not the power, it's the political idea behind, like the vision and uh, the focus of the pirates is very, very important. So. Um. Now, Birgitta, this here's a question I have, and, and I'm, I still don't have a lot of information, and I don't know if this happened, but a year ago, there was huh. talk of uh, forgiving the mortgage debt in Iceland. Did that actually happen, or was I know, I heard a rumor that there was uh, a bit yeah, of uh, uh, forgiving the mortgage debt, meaning, yeah, uh, tell us about that. And how is, I don't know much. Okay, so um, uh, there was a promise uh, by the, uh, um, the current government or the uh, Progressive Party to um, uh, slash 20% um, of the mortgage debt from not not from everybody just from the people who took loan during a certain period of time now this also sounds nice and dandy but who is going to pay it <laughs> first question is like uh um you know are the taxpayers going to pay for it i mean what about the people that didn't have any debt or people that are rental market whatever uh people that didn't have any mortgage debt uh and actually who would benefit the most from it it's actually the people with the largest debt, with the largest houses. Uh, and so, like, uh, I don't see how they're going to implement it because, first of all, if, like, this might have been possible when, before the banks were privatized again, uh, that you'd have the bank, the stakeholders from the banks uh, write it off 
on an individual level for each person that had mortgage loans uh, that got mutated loans because of uh, the crisis. Uh, I think it is an incredibly reckless idea as it is put forward uh, because um, uh, it's five years since the crisis uh, and currently we're still having people being... um, you know, have seeing foreclosures on their homes. We have an incredibly difficult situation for rent, uh, people in the rental market. Uh, and we have an incredible crisis in the healthcare system. It's just absolutely falling apart. And uh, unemployment rate has uh, gone dramatically down, but there are a lot of people actually, um, uh, there are a lot of people that have moved to Norway. And, uh, yeah, so it's, uh, I, it's been floating around. I mean, this is one of the things that, uh, my political moment wanted to do just after the crisis. Uh, we wanted, uh, some justice for all the people that had lost so much, uh, of their income, um, during the crisis. And, um, or oh, not income so much, uh, just uh, they, you know, they're more, like they're, the housing prices were really high, there was a big bubble, then all of a sudden, because we have this indexation on the loans, uh, the loans just skyrocketed, uh, and lots of people um, lost their homes or are just paying and paying and paying, and uh, uh, the price never goes down, which is quite depressing. <laughs> it's like, you keep paying like, a thousand dollars every month or more and you know what's left of your debt just keeps going up because of this indexation (laughs) so i mean but it's sort of safe rental like i've been on the rental market most of my life uh and uh because it's so awful right now uh i was forced to buy a flat uh like half cheaper than uh than renting uh, but I had to take an index loan because I don't trust the other loans. And it's just like a nightmare. Uh, this is a whole idea of having to buy concrete. I mean, but it was just um, like, because we have a tourist boom as well. Uh, so there are all these tourists coming. So there are just, everything is like, Iceland has become one big fucking hotel. <laughs> it's like they're destroying everything. Uh-oh. Like oh, all the places where you know you used to be go able to go and see live bands and stuff, they are being taken down f- to create hotels. And then rentals, uh, you know, factory, uh, you know, the heart uh, park, you know, the park that the activists had, it's been shut down. Uh, the building there, uh, and just all these different places where NASA, it, that's going to become a hotel. Uh, not NASA. That's a great club, by the way, DJ club, folks. It's been shut down. It's gonna be a hotel. Uh, you know, uh, Nexus, my favorite geek shop. Uh, it had to move, making a hotel there. <laughs> but not only that, they are. It's impossible, like, to rent anything because. Everything is rented out for tourists with furniture. So, like, if you are me, like, kids and stuff like that, you, of course, have lots of furniture and, and all my books and stuff. So, uh, I, I, it's, I can't find, so, find any place. So, I was forced to, to buy a basement uh, somewhere. So, <clears throat> um, it's crazy. Um Did Hollywood pay you any money for your involvement in the film? What about other wicked people? If so how much? I have no idea if other people. I mean, I know that Daniel got quite a. You know, if you sell a whole script, uh, like a whole book, you obviously get some money for it. Uh, and yeah, I did get some money for selling my life right. <laughs> uh, and. Um, Are you a NATO representative for Iceland? No. Uh, 
He used to be uh, part of the, uh, that was a uh, in when I was in the parliament last time, like everything changes between parliaments. Uh, so all the committees you used to be, you have to renegotiate if you do anything. Do you hear me now? Okay, so I was actually uh, a, a part of the NATO Parliamentary Assembly, uh, which is like, it's sort of like uh, a theater uh, for, like, I don't know, a cookie decoration for NATO or something. It doesn't really have lots of power. Uh, uh, but it's lots of committees and, and so forth. But you can actually make really interesting and good reports there. Uh, so I was like there with all these former... Um, you know, foreign affairs ministers and stuff like that. It's mostly guys uh, in the NATO Parliamentary Assembly. And I was there just after the release of the Afghan war logs. Uh, and I had a huge Wikileaks sticker on my computer. <laughs> and I kept asking, have now us, uh, because the parliamentarians didn't have access to this uh, information that was in the war logs, um, I kept asking them if, in, if they didn't want to do a report with these findings that were critical for any support for, you know, continuous warfare in Afghanistan. <laughs> they all thought I was some sort of hacker, hacker girl, like, uh, uh, and was sort of holding on to their computers, um, whereas I'm just a legal hacker. I don't know how to hack into computers. Uh, uh, anyway, so I did, uh, I did actually... Because I, I want to go in there to learn how this functions. I want to go everywhere and learn how everything functions in our systems. Uh, and so uh, there was, um, I did a few, uh, a few interesting things there. So there was like this really awful report done in my committee about cybersecurity. And I, um, they, were, they were discussing WikiLeaks, they were discussing dueling Julian Assange and, and Planning and, and all these, you know, snap and, and all these different things. And it was just so full of errors and prejudgment. So uh, I had actually crowdsourced this report uh, in its draft uh, on my Facebook. I said, uh, any of my friends that are willing to go and just comb through this and look for errors? And so I had five three different continents uh, looking through errors and bringing forward amendments. And, and uh, the chair of the committee was, of course, not aware of this. So I say, when they're about to ratify the report, I said, ah, excuse me, but uh, I have to protest. Uh, this is full of errors, and I cannot put my name to this whatsoever unless you fix these errors. And this had never been done uh, in the committee or any committee whatsoever. Uh, and so he gets really confused, and he says, well, you have three hours to or two hours to put forward amendments. They have to be written. And then I sort of ran out and went through all the amendments and put them all together and had like 70 amendments. <laughs> yeah, but it was beautiful. So we managed to fix the, most, uh, the worst errors in it. Um, and then the, the head of uh, NATO, uh, he didn't like, the parliamentarian assembly, they always take themselves quite seriously. Uh, and uh, it's come like it's the rule, the tradition that the head of NATO uh, shows up at the assembly and speaks to the assembly, which was at the time Antis for Rasmussen. And um, uh, so he, th he didn't come. So I organized to, um, he just sent a video. So I had organized, and this was not traditional either, to actually address this. So I stood up after the video and I scolded him really badly. I said, what sort of disrespect is this to the dem democratic process? And <laughs> they all for me. It was quite ironic. Uh, so uh, they, they um, it really, everything you do in this job really depends on how you apply your, yourself. And if you don't take yourself to them seriously uh, and, um, uh, and you know and I appreciated that they <clears throat> you know see it like one of the things I lobbied for when I was within the NATO PA was uh, more transparency and that the um, like most parliaments are not aware of what the money they allocate to NATO most of the NATO allied countries are not aware of what the money is spent for 
And but there has been some people, I don't know, the last speaker or president of the NATO PA actually was elected because of this uh, transparency focus. So, you know, you gradually speak enough about it and you, you get, you know, you find that there are actually lots more people that are in agreement with you and you can actually move and change things a little bit. Not quick enough for my taste, but, you know, that's why I would never last in this for long. <laughs> no, he didn't. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, so I'm now the, uh, uh, the, I got a seat now in the International Parliamentary Union and I'm just heading off there in a couple of weeks. I will be meeting with um, the Human Rights Committee for Parliamentarians because of the violations uh, into my privacy by the Department of Justice. And uh, they're making actually uh, a report on uh, privacy, uh, online privacy, and I'm I'm hoping that I can actually help with that. To address the uh, um, assembly about these issues. So uh, I, I think you know more and more people are waking up to the reality uh, that we have to uh, we have to do something immediately. Uh, no, the IMF are not controlling the Iceland government spending. Uh, I to organize <laughs> I, I actually tried to organize people, you know, the grassroots movement to protest the IMF. Most people had no idea what the IMF is really about. I had seen a few uh, documentaries about it and uh, I read um, economic statement. And yeah, so I read uh, John Perkins' books, um, uh, Confessions of an Economic Hitman, and so forth. So I was aware of uh, you know what they'd been doing, for example, in Jamaica. So a very powerful documentary from there. Uh, and um, I, I met with the representatives from the IMF, uh, you know, regularly. I was uh, I, I, I'm not sure if they liked me at the meetings. Because uh, I kept actually the guy that was first in Iceland, they sent him off to Greece, and uh, you know the IMF is really messed Greece up really badly. I mean, they mess up us up nearly as much as Greece. Um, but it's a dangerous time right now because as we're going to have to pay back what we owe the IMF, uh, and say we can't, then. Um, the tradition, uh, at least in other countries, is that <clears throat> you're going to have to give up our natural resources and stuff like that. So uh, uh, we're going to have to be very careful with uh, and aware. But it was, you know, I remember trying to get people to protest uh, and just to get people to be aware of what they're all about it was very difficult. Um, I did manage to get like a few protests going on. Do you know where the IMF had their offices? That's not symbolic. It was in the house right behind the uh, office of the prime minister. <laughs> oh, whatever happened, there was the idea floating around, I think about a year or two ago, about Iceland adopting uh, the loonie, the Canadian dollar, as its national currency. Whatever happened to that idea? Well, that was uh, the guy that suggested that was is the current prime minister now. And for Ouch! Not about it anymore. <laughs> the Icelandic krona needs to be, uh, you know, is strong enough. Blah blah blah. Um, yeah. So um, yeah, he he also wanted the Norwegian krona, I think. Um, anyway, so we have five minutes left. Um, no, Iceland is just using its uh, own little weird uh, small krona. It's not using the euro and it's not using the Canadian loony. What a weird name for a currency. Loony. <laughs> That's the nickname. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you spend it like lunatics or... 
<laughs> Actually, when the new dollar coin came out, it had the picture of a loon, you know, the bird, and it became nicknamed the loony. Ah, uh, okay, okay, okay. Right, so um, I am going to uh, off very soon. I'm just going to tell you um, that um, it's um, we are like heading into a very, very interesting times. You know, everything is possible. And if a person like me, a self proclaimed uh, pragmatic anarchist uh, and a um, heathen Buddhist can get into the Icelandic parliament. Uh, I was told in 2006 I, I, uh, I was a spokesperson for Iceland's first um, um, international activist camp to uh, it was an environmental group of people from all over the world and because it's some um, you know uh, direct action um, I was uh, you know claim to be my friends that I would never stand a chance anywhere and because that I was uh, connected you know uh, so uh, I was so controversial I was called uh, a terrorist Right, an environmental terror, uh, and uh, so if somebody like me can actually get into parliament with any money or in, any support, uh, except uh, people that want to change this, um, anybody can, you know, it's and and I'm just saying, parliament doesn't matter if it's parliament, like if you want to change Monsanto, which is way off Monsanto. Then just throw away, like, uh, just uh, buy up uh, Monsanto and, and then reading all their. Uh... <laughs> well, um, we're at living at interesting, interesting friend in times. So, um, and, uh, uh, <clears throat> there are no uh, there are no polar bears in Iceland. They occasionally wander off though from uh, Greenland via icebergs, and there are more coming because there is um, obviously we feel the effects of the global uh, warming or the climate change. I would rather say because this um, summer has been anything but warm. <laughs> uh, uh, you know, I'm very concerned about the situation up in Greenland um, much more than here because they're they're feeling it first, and they've been suffering from much more than the climate change. I mean, uh, all the poison coming from uh, when they were using, um, you know, the chemicals, uh, the pesticides. Uh, what was it called? The uh, DH. There was a like they used it in the fifties. And it seeped up through the north into the fish, into the seals, and the polar bears, because they have it collects in the fat. Uh, they have, you know, they're completely changed. Uh, and people, the Greenland people, the um, uh, they get all sorts of illnesses because of it. Um, so I'm very concerned about Greenland, both because of global warming and because all the big corporate you know crazies have figured out how much resources they have uh, and uh, they are having a big aluminum company mining companies they're all coming uh, and abusing um, uh, this you know is a very small nation there's still sort of colony under Denmark and it's just uh, you know support the Greenland people if you possibly can <laughs> and do not forget my Tibetan friends. There is so much suffering there right now. All right. Um, it's 12 o'clock in Iceland. Uh, I have to get my son to bed. <laughs> uh, I am very pleased that you had me. And thank you so much for this initiative. Uh, I'll be making sure I, I follow. Up with
the panels that are going to be coming up. Yes, there's a really good one coming up. And thank you there, Birgitta. Uh, I just want to say that when we put the call out to this uh, International Livestream Congress back in February, I, I sent you an SMS and within five minutes you said you could speak to it and that really set the tone for this. And literally the who's who of the live stream world is here and we are setting the agenda for we being the newest medium and we're starting just within two years. The Occupy movement, the best thing that come out of it is the live streams. So much so that the role of civilian journalist is really gelled. Again, the, the live streams are sword and shield that Last year, in 2012, mainstream media lost 35% market share to us because people are fed up and they're waking up. So we have the who's who coming up right after you. 35% uh, captain. Yes. Wow. And, that is impressive. And uh, so thank you. Bless Adarin. Bless, bless. Bless. See you on now. Bye-bye. Yao, yeah, yao, yao. Okay, thank you, Birgitta. Thank you. Yar, folks. <laughs> that was Birgitta Yomstotti. Um, uh, we thank you so much. Um, and uh, coming up next, we have, uh, give me about five minutes to do some quick paperwork. We have uh, Vlad Techberg, the media guru behind Global Rev, even though he hates being called that. We also have uh, Matt Hopard. We have Punk Boy who's in the house and anyone else because Vlad we got um, the co-founder of uh, Nat Nader Media the, uh, the Revolt Istanbul Occupy Istanbul um, live stream we have Zoe from Florida anybody that wants to join the mumble chat the, the next is coming up in about five minutes um, let me just do some um, the uh, Vladsky the Vladsky eh? is that Vlad the Impaler no Vlad the Cool no any other names? Come on. I can't think of any right now, but I just know the Impaler <laughs> and the Fool. Vlad the Wicked. The V. Yeah. So um, give me uh, about five minutes or so and to set everything up, uh, maybe five to ten minutes. Uh, uh, thank you there, Fred. Thank you for saving the hey, chat. Hey, Big Mama. Uh, someone was telling me about that uh, video about the radiation. Did you show that? No. Man, I hear it's something you should see. You should ask Big Mama to put it on, man. Yeah. Okay, so what it's going to be, uh, it's going to be on Mumble. So I will, let me set it up, and when I come back, I'll let you know how to get on Mumble. We explained Mumble yesterday. So how we're going to do this is everybody uh, who wants to join the discussion at Mumble, uh, we, we, could, we, we could do it. And, uh, yeah, Orn. 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 Is he yeah, Icelandic too? Of course. Orn Einarsson, the son of Einar. Yeah, and Birgitta yeah. is Jón's dotty. She is the dotty. Of How come the, the Icelandic Oden. parliament don't bow to Odin? I don't know. Because the banksters won't? I don't know. Yeah, I don't know what. Anyways, they thank should you. bow to Odin. Uh oh, uh oh. Okay, thank you, folks. So, since we live streamers don't say bye, rather we say peace out and see you on the live chat. We'll be Sir right back. Odin. Bless Adrian. Yow, yow, yow. Ciao, folks.